Hey everyone, I'm Shah, and in this video, I'm going to continue the series on decision trees and talk about decision tree ensembles. So instead of just using one decision tree, a tree ensemble combines a collection of decision trees into a single model. So with that, let's get into the video. So like I just said, a decision tree ensemble is a collection of decision trees which are combined into a single model. So if you recall from the previous video, we saw decision trees where a way we can make predictions through a series of yes or no questions. And they look something like this. You start at the top node here and just follow the arrowheads based on predictor variable values, which eventually lead you to your final prediction. On the other hand, a decision tree ensemble will look something more like this. So now instead of a single decision tree, we have multiple decision trees, each giving a prediction, and then we can combine these predictions together to give us our final estimation. And the key benefit of a decision tree ensemble is that it generally performs better than any single decision tree alone. And we'll kind of touch on why this is the case a little later in the video. But first, I'm going to talk about two different types of decision tree ensembles. The first one is bagging, which is short for bootstrap aggregation or bootstrap aggregation, bootstrapped bootstrapped aggregation. First short for bootstrapped aggregation, and then the second one is called boosting, which isn't short for anything. Starting with bagging, here the idea is to train a set of decision trees one at a time by randomly sampling with replacement. So what the heck does this mean? So we'll just walk through this one step at a time. Say we start with our training data set T0 and each of these blocks here represents a different record or example in our training data set. So we have record one, we have record two, three, four, five. What we do here is we create another training data set by randomly sampling T not with replacement. What this might look like is this, where we randomly pick five records from the original training data set. And so notice record number three actually shows up twice in this training data set. This just follows from sampling with replacement. So basically all that means is every time we pick a record from T0 for T1, we will replace it before making a second pick. So we have this new training data set T1, we can just do the same thing and we get T2. So let's say this time we really got a lot of twos through this random sample and then so on and so forth and then let's say the nth training data set looks something like this so now notice instead of just a single training data set we have a collection of training data sets which allows us to train a collection of decision trees so that could look something like this and then just like we saw in that first slide we can combine the predictions from each of these decision trees to produce our final prediction so one of the most popular machine learning algorithms that uses bagging is called random forest. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that in this video, but for those who are interested, be sure to check out the blog published in Towards Data Science where I give a few more details about random forest. Additionally, there's a really nice paper by the creator of the random forest algorithm, Bremen, who is very well known for his work on decision trees and decision tree ensembles. So I would definitely recommend reading that paper if you're into that kind of stuff. The second type of decision tree ensemble we're going to talk about uses is something called boosting. So boosting is completely different than bagging. So here we will recursively train decision trees using an error-based reweighting scheme. No worries if this doesn't make any sense. We're going to walk through what I mean by this one step at a time. So again, imagine we start with this training data set T0, but now we're going to introduce this concept of weight. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Essentially, we can give different records in our data set more weight or more importance when it comes to developing our model. So we'll just start with T0 in such a way that all the weights are equal. So every record, every example is equally important. And then we can use this training data set to create a decision tree. We'll call it H0. But now we can create another training data set based on the performance of this decision tree. And so that might look something like this. So notice the different colors here. All this is showing is that 
records one and four were correctly classified in this binary classification problem we're trying to solve, while records two, three, and five were incorrectly classified. And so what we can do now is we can decrease the weight of records one and four and increase the weights of two, three, and five. And then with that, we have this new training data set T1 and we can train a new decision tree. We'll call it H1 and then we can repeat this process. We evaluate the predictions of H1. We see which records were correctly predicted, which records were incorrectly predicted, update their weights accordingly, create another decision tree, and so on and so forth. And we can do this for however long that we want. Now notice, again, we have a collection of decision trees. And we can just aggregate the predictions of these decision trees into a single estimate. The first technique that really introduced this idea of boosting is called Adaboost or Adaptive Boosting. And so when people are talking about boosting, they're typically talking about a process similar to what we see in Adaboost, which is essentially what I walk through here. Just explaining some of the details a bit more here. So basically all that Adaboost does is it combines each of these decision trees into a linear model and weights each of the decision tree predictions based on this alpha value. And then the alpha value is just proportional to the decision tree's performance. And here what I've written out is the specific reweighting scheme used in Adaboost. So notice that incorrectly classified records will get a weight update proportional to this value, while correctly predicted records will have their weight updated proportional to this factor over here. Ever since Adaboost was introduced in the mid 90s, there have been two major innovations around this idea of boosting. The first of which is called gradient boosting. So instead of talking about the specific reweighting scheme and details of Adaboost, gradient boosting just provides a more generalized framework where you can take any differentiable loss function and define this gradient and define some boosting strategy from it. So the second major innovation comes from a library called XGBoost, which basically makes the gradient boosting idea much more scalable and computationally efficient through a set of different heuristics. And so that's all I'm going to say about those. I talk a little bit more about gradient boosting and XGBoost in the blog associated with this video. And I also have the original references for those ideas in the blog as well. So now coming back to this question of why are decision tree ensembles better than just single decision trees? And if I were to summarize everything into a single picture, it would be something like this. We're essentially going away from point estimates toward population estimates. So what I mean by this is instead of just having a single number as our prediction from our decision tree, we now have a population of predictions from our decision tree ensemble, which has these three main benefits that I'm going to talk about now. So the first key benefit is that decision tree ensembles are much more robust to the overfitting problem than single decision trees. So if you saw the previous video of this series, we saw that overfitting is when your machine learning model essentially over optimizes to a single training data set in such a way that when you try to apply it to new data, it doesn't work as well. This turns out to be a pretty big problem for just single decision trees. But this problem for a lot of cases tends to go away when you start aggregating groups of decision trees together. The second key benefit of decision tree ensembles are more robust feature importance rankings. So importance rankings are a critical output of any decision tree based method. And so these can be based on things like information gain or out of bag error if we're talking about random forest or any number of different ways that we want to define importance. Some of these quantities that we can use to define importance are only possible through tree ensemble based approaches. So if one example is out of bag error defined in the random forest algorithm. So I won't get into all the details of that. If you're interested, I talk a little bit about it in the blog. But all that to say is that tree ensemble based approaches not only open up more ways of defining importance, but now kind of going back to this idea of population estimates, we're not just relying on the importance of our features from one view of the data, essentially from one decision tree, but through having a wide collection of decision trees, our importance rankings can become more robust. And then finally, the last key benefit of decision tree ensembles is through population estimates, we now have a pretty straightforward way to quantify our confidence or uncertainty in our model's prediction. 
predictions. And anytime you want to use your model in the real world or there are physical consequences for your model, it's good to have some measure of confidence or uncertainty just so you know your exposure. While if you just have a point estimate, you don't really know the confidence of your prediction. It could be zero uncertainty or it can be infinite uncertainty. So that's another case where population estimates are very beneficial. Okay, now we're gonna jump into some example code. So here we're going to do breast cancer prediction using decision tree ensembles. Like always, we're gonna use the sklearn Python library, which is one of the most popular machine learning Python libraries there is. And then the data that we're gonna use for this example comes from the UCI machine learning repository. So the first step is we import our Python libraries. So just kind of running through quickly, we have pandas to help wrangle our data, numpy to do some math, matplotlib will help us make some nice visualizations, sklearn datasets. So this is the data set while it's originally from the UCI machine learning repository, sklearn has this data set readily available for us. And this is my short apology for using a toy data set and not wrangling a data set from the real world. But the point of this is to focus on the tree ensembles and not the data preparation step. So I hope you'll forgive me. Next, I imported Smote. So this is optional. I have it commented out for the results we're gonna see here. But if you're interested, head over to the GitHub, uncomment this code block, and you'll be able to see what the results are doing here. And if you recall, we used Smote in the previous example to balance our imbalanced data set. And then finally, we import a whole bunch of other things from sklearn, this handy function to create a training and testing data set, decision tree classifier, and then we import all the different tree ensemble approaches that we've talked about. So random forest, add a boost, and gradient boosting. And then finally, we import three different evaluation metrics for our decision trees. Basically, what we're going to do in this example is we're going to train four different models using these four different approaches, and we're just going to compare their performance. sklearn makes it super easy to import this toy data set, just one line of code. We have it in a pandas data frame. And then it's always a good practice to plot the histograms of your data. Here are all the predictor variables we have at our disposal. And then here is our target variable. So this kind of goes back to the imbalanced data set idea. We see that there are a lot more cases where the breast tumor is benign as opposed to malignant. And so while we could apply smote here to synthetically oversample the minority class, we're not going to do anything here and see how the four different models hold up. Okay, next we define our predictor and target variables. So this is basically grabbing everything but the last variable name in our data frame. This is grabbing the very last variable name in the data frame. And then this is just creating two data frames based on the variable names. And then with that, we can easily create our training and testing data sets. Here we use an 80-20 split. sklearn makes this super easy. A bit of a warning with this next block of code, because I just inherently refuse to copy and paste code over and over again, I use what I've heard referenced as automatic code generation. And basically all that's gonna happen here is instead of explicitly writing the Python command out and then copy pasting, changing one thing, copy pasting, changing one thing, and so on, you can define your Python command as a string and then use this handy execute function to execute the command. So while this might conceal kind of like what's going on here, this is just a much cleaner way and convenient way that I found to write code. And I'm sure there are gonna be some programmers out there that are gonna yell at me for doing this, but I haven't run into any major issues writing code this way. So I'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts on this. While it might conceal kind of what's going on here, I have everything printed out. So essentially what's being dynamically written here is this single line of code. So all that's happening is four different models are being created using the four different things we imported from sklearn. So decision tree classifier is our lone decision tree. The random forest classifier uses random forest, add a boost, and then gradient boosting. So all these different models are initialized in this CLF data structure. And then each of these are stored in a list. So now we have a list of models, as you can see here. The automatic code generation gets even worse here because we have a lot of combinatorics happening. So we have four different models, we have two different data sets, and we have three different performance metrics we want to define for each of these cases. So this code block may not make a whole lot of sense, but I printed everything that's being dynamically written here. So let's just look at these first three.
accessory lines. So all that's happening is we're going one model at a time for the models in our list, and we're going to apply it to the training data set and get a prediction. And then we're going to compute the precision recall in F1 for this model applied to the training data set. So that's what these three lines of code do here. And then we do the same exact thing with the same exact model, but now for the testing data set. So we get a prediction, compute the precision, recall F1 score, and we just append everything to the same list and so on for each model. The results get stored in this performance dict. It's just a dictionary that we initialized here where the keys are the different model names and the values are all the performance metrics relevant to that model. And then after all that, this dictionary gets all filled up for all four models, for all three evaluation metrics and for both data sets. And we can just convert it all to a pandas data frame. And so if this is all confusing and doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. What matters is this final output here where we can just simply look at all four of our models and all the different performance metrics that we have and just compare them together. So we can see that all four models performed perfectly on the training data set. So we can see the precision recall F1 score for the training data set is one. But the real test is looking at the performance metrics for the testing data set. And so in this context, we can use as a rule of thumb, the difference in performance between the training and testing data sets is indicative of overfitting. Put that more simply, the smaller these values are, the more overfitting that model is showing. Based on that heuristic, we can see that the decision tree classifier seems to be overfitting most because it has the worst performance when applied to the testing data set. So on the other side of it, random forest and gradient boosting seem to have the best performance when looking at the F1 score. A close second is at a boost, which has an F1 score of 0.963. And so these results makes sense. They agree with this story and intuition that tree ensembles are more robust to overfitting than single decision trees alone. So two things I did not explore in this example, which are obvious next steps, are looking at the feature importance rankings for all four models, and then additionally doing some kind of uncertainty estimate for each of these models. Okay, so that's basically it. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more, be sure to check out the blog published in Towards Data Science, linked in the description below. Again, feel free to steal the code from the GitHub repository referenced here. Also, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.